Get it on, get it on. Hi, everybody. Look, I got my little Mickey Mouse mask. I'm going to go maskless because I'm the one that's sick. Meg is sick. I am really sick. If any of you have whatever, sick kids at home, Godspeed. What am I looking for? See, look how cute they are. It's Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. Um, this is uh, when we redid, when we, when we just demoed my house, um, we ended up... Um, what am I trying to say? Oh, my daughter was helping, and they don't make safety masks for little kids for demo and dust and all the terrible things. So, um, so anyway, we uh, got her these little um, medical masks for kids that are six. Anyway, they're super cute. Yeah. Um, we are in the Chamber of Commerce um, conference room. Thanks. We were downtown at a city hall meeting. Your favorite, favorite bureaucracy. Yeah, she even made me sit in a circle with it humans. Did. With circle with, and do the humans, and she's sick and the extra not wanting to hang out with humans. How much I love her. Right? So, anywho, um, this is where we're at. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for being patient about us being a couple minutes late. We're literally, it's a beautiful snowy day today, and we're racing across downtown to get here. So, um, Meg has a list of the announcements. Would you like to read them, or do you want me to read them? I, I will read the announcements. I might not be much good after this. I know, I'm afraid to lose up all your energy on the announcements. It took a lot of energy to get dressed. I bet. Um, Rachel is in Rapid for Discovery Meetings on Friday. So she'll be down there with uh, Susan Geisel, who is one of our independent consultants. Um, uh, February 22nd. I forgot about that. Uh, good thing we did the announcements, so we remember what we're doing. PDI conference, uh, professional development conference for South Dakota School of Mines. Rachel will be attending that. I'll be speaking at that. I oh. think uh, at like, I think eleven. It's a student. It's for students. So. All right. Sweet. Yeah. Um, we are in the office for the next couple <laughs> of weeks. Getting ready for March Madness. Um, mm -hmm. Our own March Madness, not necessarily uh, basketball March Madness. It's really fortuitous, actually, that if I were going to be miserably sick, that it happened this week. In February, much yeah. better choices than March. So Rachel has um, project management training camp uh, March 2 through 4, um, and then 4 through 6 is a guiding organizational change. Both of those are really excellent if you're looking to learn more or up your game about how do you manage projects and help people through uh, big changes. Yeah, and that is, you can actually just buy, register, and pay on the website under products. So you can navigate right to that. Thanks, Shelly, for setting that up. Um, March 11th through the 13th, uh, Shelly and I will be in Cleveland. Yes, Cleveland. that's Cleveland. Yep, yes. Um, for the Northern Ohio Human Resources Conference. So it's a SHRM conference. It's a huge one, I guess, really um, widely attended. And I will be speaking during the executive forum. Hopefully I won't sound like this. Uh, so that'll be fun. And then March 12th through the 18th, Rachel and Cappy actually will be at the Abundance and Wealth Real Estate Cruise uh, as keynote speakers. Um, and that, they you take flight. Take, what do you call it? I don't know, but I might have to get my mask out. <laughs> yeah, right? Coronavirus. For the cruise. Uh, yeah. The, the cruise ship situation right now. Yeah. Ugh. So you'll be taking off out of Orlando. Yeah, so if you are interested in real estate and there's some really, really interesting speakers about figuring out how to invest, how to work with property owners to help them out of trouble, like a lot of really cool things. So if you have any kind of interest in that, it's like a three-day cruise. So it's, um, it's not really huge. It's not very expensive. I guess it's not a sort of... Um, it's not a, yeah, it's not a high pressure time to go cruising. And so it's kind of, I think it's like 600 bucks for a cabin for the four days or whatever. And that includes, you know, the food and drink and all the things. So if you're interested, spend some time in the Caribbean. Nice. And merch. Uh, okay, weekly planner quote, fixers tend to fix problems. Independents tend to act independently. Organizers tend to organize. And stabilizers tend to create stability. Hence the names. We're making it easy for you. <laughs> uh, weekly writing prompt. Uh, where do you volunteer? If you're not currently volunteering, where would you like to volunteer? Uh, and what are your goals for volunteering in 2020? Hmm, that's a good question. What, what are you doing for volunteering? 
Uh, I'm the chair for the Northern Hills Junior Achievement Board. Um, and what else? I'm uh, I'm on the advisory committee, advisory board for South Dakota Center for Enterprise Opportunity. I am um, I'm on the advisory board for NAU's Paralegal Studies program. I did not know that. Look at you. Yeah. So I like it. Um, seems like there's something else. I I also do. I volunteered for Junior Achievement. Those are the major ones. Shelly always brings up a couple more that I forget, but those are the major ones I dedicate time to. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. I don't, I'm not I'm volunteering very much at the moment, but um, I do um, love to support the Booth Society, the Fish Hatchery, where I can. Um, I do um, work with the Northern Hills Chamber Corral and do some volunteering with them. Um, on a business side, um, I am a... A trustee at South Dakota State. It's definitely a volunteer gig. Um, and then I'm also an advisor on a couple um, company boards that are, it's more, uh, it's not really nonprofit, but volunteering to support other small business owners, figure out how to move forward and what options might be and how can I support them. So we probably do more volunteering than we think. Yeah. Well, we actually spend a lot of time I mean, we donate a lot of our we time. We donate a lot of time. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. <laughs> so there's that. Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, we just came from the city hall meeting where we were offering our perspective on some new changes going on that will um, support our desire to have our own building, which is very exciting. Well, so exciting. So anyway, so that is, I guess, also a donation to the governing bodies of our town. Yeah. So what are your goals for volunteering? My volunteering goals. Um, you know, my goals on volunteering, actually what I would love to do from a volunteering perspective is actually up my donation levels because almost every single volunteer group I work with, what they desperately need is cash. I mean, me being there to help with events is really great. What they really need is money. So I guess my volunteer goal is to have the time to do the volunteering I want, but also um, being financially able to donate much larger sums of money for projects that I'm really passionate about. Very good. Everyone hates fundraising, so might as well sure. help. How about you? Uh, mine is to really um, make an impact in terms of the value created by the nonprofit organizations that I'm supporting. So Junior Achievement uh, really has some it provides incredible opportunities, learning opportunities for our youth um, that I would say is a little bit lukewarm received in mm -hmm. a lot of our schools around here. Um, and so I'm, my, my goal is to say, okay, well, I understand that this is a little bit cumbersome to add it to your curriculum and all the time you have to spend, but then how can we make it valuable so it doesn't seem um, onerous? Right, because at the same time, everyone's saying, these are the skills that our young people need. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like implementing that seems hard. So I could see where that would be a good way to leverage both needs in a way that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Um, I think the next one is just down to the questions of the board. Yep. Um, serving on a community board can be challenging. Um, let's see. We have a couple votes here. Um, well, the first one with two votes, how do I decide if I'm a good fit for a certain community board? Um, well, for me, you have to be passionate about the topic, first of all, because um, no matter how, um, no matter what your intentions might be, if you don't love, love, love the topic, then it, you're not going to be successful fighting for it. Um, yeah, I guess you're going to have yeah. to deal with some people you really don't like, frankly. Right. Or opinions, not people, opinions you really don't appreciate and disagree and, with yeah. and you there isn't much you can do ab about that you know you can't it's not a business where you are the boss and you get to say no you will go do the thing really too bad that that's the case yeah. that is true so you better really be passionate about it because you're gonna have to deal with things that are gonna make you not passionate and I guess the other thing uh, check who else is on the board um, and see if there are people that you want to work with because if you're really passionate about what's happening, but literally your worst enemy is on the board, then that's not going to be a pleasant for anybody. 
not you, not them, not anyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess the third thing for me would be understand what kind of board you're getting on. So the boards that I support that are business boards are much more advisory. They call me when they have a challenge on something or need a connection to a certain industry or whatever. And then I write an email. Um, Community boards um, tend to be much more active boards. In fact, when I was on the Booth Society board for, I don't know, I think seven years, we decided that that would be a new requirement is that everyone that comes on the board um, commits to actually spending time doing events and all that. So it is a time commitment. And I think you have to be really aware of the type of board and the type of service that's expected. Um, Cause a lot of people just think, well, I'm gonna go serve on a board and that's gonna make me feel good. And it's gonna check a box for my boss and then I'm good. But that doesn't actually support the organization very well. Yeah. And I would say, um, um, one Monday a month or whatever the requirements are, because they're usually pretty small requirements. Sounds like it's not a big deal, but when you throw that on top of a soccer schedule or a dance schedule or just your own life or whatever I have right now, it's like, and then you don't make it two or three Mondays in a row, um, you start to feel like you're not a very good board member. So be sure that you can actually you commit the time. Aren't. You probably aren't. You probably a aren't a very good board member. Um, so those are the things that I would say. And frankly, if you have any kind of inkling that you have, the, I'll just, well, maybe we can answer this in the second question. But if you have any inkling about helping, but you're not sure you want to be a board member, any organization, any nonprofit organization would love to have you volunteer to help with a single event, even the night of the event, two hours at the gala to raise money for heart cancer or with the hospital they would love it if you showed up and helped so if you're not sure you're ready to commit the time may talk to that organization anyway and say hey i love what you're doing but i don't have any time is there something i can do specific that can help and they will always or they should always be able to come up with something where you can help and feel like you're really contributing yeah and if someone asks you to be on a board, so what, before we move on to the next question, mm-hmm. so somebody said, oh, man, you'd be great for blah, blah, board. Do not, I'll repeat, do not just say yes. Uh, speaking from experience, <laughs> do not just say yes. Say, you know what, I'd, I'm really interested in that. Could I come to a couple of your meetings so I can understand better what your objectives are for the board and what the requirements are to be a good fit and a good board member? So you can always go to a few of their events, a few um, what it, meetings, mm-hmm. and, and then you learn a little bit about who's there and what their opinions are and what the commitment feels like before you say yes. Do not say yes first. Yeah, if n- anything else, um, give yourself a solid 24 hours before you even commit to attending a meeting. At a minimum. Because um, I, that was some advice from one of the SDCEO speakers a couple of years ago about she said she's a very organized woman much more so than we are but she always said she gave herself 24 hours before she would say yes or no to sit back and think about it look at calendars and think can i actually even because if you go to the meeting then they hope that you're going to do it so you know all of that stuff and i always thought that was really good advice because i'm as chaos people we're ones to be like yes instead of just a minute let me get back to you on that so don't be afraid to to Put them off for a day or two. Yeah, which is why we have to get a desk calendar and put in our office. Oh my God, I got so we don't get old desk calendar <laughs> because it is insane. Our schedules are insane uh, for speaking clients. It's all good, wonderful things, but I don't know. We're gonna have to figure out some kind of I don't know meditation routine or oh, something. I know. Something. Will it keep me from getting sick? Because I'm in. No, I think this is your body's way of just purging the demons, and then. You'll be ready to go. That's it. That's what's happening. Urging the demons. Okay, you're ready for the, the, my spiritual magician friends would say that you are getting ready for a big up level because your body is freaking out. Well, I'm telling so. you, there has been some serious <laughs> perch going on here. So I'm telling, it's going to be huge. Sorry, Shelly, but some good shit is headed our way. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's going to be huge. This is it's going to be, be huge. huge. Can All you right. please rip this paper when we're done? I know, totally. <laughs> It's really great some controversy. All right, so how can I use my knowledge of culture types to be a more effective board member? Oh, thank you. I was like, I don't know what that word is. More effective board member. Um, 
I love this question because we are brought in to deal with issues around culture types around boards all the time. Because of course, the biggest challenge about boards is that you never see each other. You see each other once a, once a month if you are all there all the time for like two hours of a very specific agenda. There is very little chance to create relationships, build trust. And so then in those environments, the culture types become like even more intense. Like everyone kind of retreats to their corner and hisses like casks. So the, the, to be very savvy about culture types in that environment will be hugely beneficial too. Do you have some examples? Um, we, could, we could probably think of some. Do you want me to go? Yeah. I, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just, my brain. It's okay. It's all right. Part of the other challenges of be having boards is that often it's people like Meg and I who are running a company or are a vice president of a bank or whatever you might be, entrepreneur. And um, they're used to just deciding things. And then when you show up, then you have seven people in the room that are used to deciding things. And then all of a sudden they have to actually pay attention and navigate each other's personalities is uh, kind of nuts. And so I remember when I first um, was introduced to the society probably 12 years ago. Uh, so their, uh, their focus is supporting the hatchery, conservation education, out, getting outside, that kind of stuff. And when I first met them, it was being run by a person who literally would like give you 30 seconds to speak. And that was it. And then you went on to the next topic. And like, it was the weirdest thing. But he was a bank president. He was used to just dictating what the hell was going on. And I went in there and I left there going, and I was just being introduced as someone who was working in the building. And, um, and I went and I walked out of that room and thought, ugh, I would never want to work with this group. So really understanding how to navigate some of those personality issues is uh, culture types can help you tremendously. Yeah. And I think that if you couldn't get, you know, a, a group or a board to take the culture type assessment they say, Oh, I didn't have time for that. Or listen, this isn't a big part of my life. I'm not going to waste even three minutes trying to do that. One other trick you could um, sort of employ to help yourself a little bit is Mad Hatter principles. So a lot of times that we see, um, Rachel had a good example when she worked with a, um, a community, like a city, um, Oh yeah. Well, chamber, that, it was like a chamber board. Yeah. Like a, of, yeah, a chamber board. Board, something like Yeah. That. And they really, the issue was that, um, they did, they wouldn't give each other grace for their different perspectives in the way that, the decisions they were making were supporting or not supporting their businesses uh, respectively. And so that's another thing to think about. If you don't get everybody to do their culture types or if you can't quite pinpoint what you think someone might be, you know, you can think about where are they coming from and why are they coming from there? And then you can ask them questions about, you know, uh, I never thought about it from that, from where you, what your perspective probably is. Tell me more about why this seems painful for you or why you really think that this is a better option, you know, for you. And then they have an opportunity to kind of talk about what's interesting to them. So you can learn a little bit more, get a little more insight about into how their brain is working. And that is a wicked good tool to have in give your some, toolkit. Give you some tips. Because the biggest challenge that we see, especially in a board like a, a community board, is that you're going to have some people who are going to be on the order tolerant side and you're going to have some in the chaos tolerant side. And what that means is, is that the order tolerant side is going to want to have more details, the plan, what's the strategy, who's doing it, when does this happen, does it affect something else? And uh, the chaos people are going to be much more interested in hand waving and whiteboarding and all of that. And so the tension that happens, as you can imagine, is to say, oh, well, I want to do this new thing and it's going to be great. And I just think it'll be so cool. And we'll just figure it out as we go. And then three other people in the room are like, listen, this is a half baked idea. It's like, you've had a lot, you've had a great idea every time we've met and nothing has ever come of it. And so you start getting these really difficult environments where you can actually idea generate and think be open. And so what you can do is sort of create that expectation to say, listen, we know this is just an idea. Um, let's 
hold off on the detailed planning right now and let's just talk about if we like this idea and then if you people like the idea and you can work on that then you can say okay we understand that we have to have a plan in place for this so how are we going to do that who's going to help develop it and so just be really aware that you have these very two different perspectives on event planning new ideas fundraising ideas how do you spend the money all the things that go into board community boards it's going to be very um that's the pieces that you can really use culture types to help actually achieve the things that you want to achieve is to just recognize you've got both types in the room and how do you support both so that everybody in the end is moving in the same direction because that's a really really big challenge especially if you're trying to revitalize an organization or have a new big effort or initiative those are the things that people will really get people at odds with each other mm -hmm. All right. All right. Last one. Uh, what are common challenges volunteer board members face? Uh, Assholes. Uh, where? What? In the board? On the board? Yeah. No. Oh. And outside of the board. Uh, my favorite is people who criticize what the board decisions are, um, but aren't on the board, have never been on the board, haven't come to a board meeting, have never offered their opinion before, don't volunteer at any of the events. Those are my favorite. Yeah. The I can't, I don't know the, a nice way to say it, but they throw the punch, they throw bad stuff in the punch bowl. Yes, yes, turn the punch bowl, people. Turn the punch bowl. Right, they're not going to drink the punch. Right, They've never they want to ruin it anything for everybody else. For the, it, for the punch, and they still... Right, it's like having a potluck, and the one guy that doesn't bring anything complaining about the food. Yes. Right, it's like, that's not okay. So, that's a great one, yeah, actually. Yeah, that's a, when, when we ran the rodeo, the 4-H rodeo <clears throat> in Butte County, that was... Uh, I mean, and there, there were a lot of interested parties, and there were a lot of people that I was really glad were not on the board, that, right. that were, had every right to come bellyache about, you know, the ground was right, or we should have postponed it, or whatever. A thousand so, things. So, I mean, there, there's always some validity to it, back to my previous comment about give people grace, but that's my favorite um, one, is when, that I, I struggle to deal with the, the most, is when somebody who's not really doing anything to support comes in and complains about something that's going on. My biggest uh, frustration is the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So when people, when you're at the board meeting and you say, listen, we've got this big event, it's our signature event. We need seven people to come. Here's all the freaking stations and all the things that you set up. Cause you know, that's not me. That's not my favorite thing. Cause I'm the chaos person, but I know I will sit down and get, what people have, how many people I need, and then people sign up, and then they bail, or they don't show, or they don't do the things, or you say, okay, if you're going to do this, this is what you should do, and then at the, at the event, they come running up to you because they haven't paid attention, or whatever, and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing, or where they're going, and it's just like, I have very little patience for that, like, the chaos that I want, love, and, and try to foster is a creative chaos, not the destroying optimism and happiness kind of chaos. So I really do not like people who just are saying yes because they don't have the courage to say I can't make it or no. Um, they just say yes because it feels good at the moment, but they don't actually follow through. That is what I think my biggest complaint is on volunteer boards for sure. Yeah, I think another one that you'll see um, you might have some people who have been on a board for a really long time or part of a, an organization for a really long time and they've always spearheaded, you know, one event or one sort of part of whatever it is and they don't, they're not really very interested in any new ideas. This <laughs> happens to me a lot as an independent because right, I'm like, have lots of new ideas. I'm like, hey, we should try this thing and that thing and this other thing and look at there's seven ducks flying in the air and then it's like, you hush over there, little girl. Uh, be quiet in your corner. So um, be ready for that. I, I'm not saying if you have ideas, don't go be a volunteer, but um, the, you have to sort of spin yourself into or weave yourself into the fabric that has already been um, put in place. Yeah. Um, you, you can't just go on making your own new blanket. Uh, but I think the I think that uh, goes back to the culture type conversation because a lot of times people that stay with an organization a really long time do the same thing every year and they're great at it and their heart's in the right place and they're passionate. God bless them for doing it because if it wasn't for people like that, we would never 
have shit done, get shit done. <laughs> so, you know, so you go into a stabilizer and you want to put your new ideas in. How do you navigate that to actually help push the organization forward or the event forward without feeling like you have to alienate everybody? Now, there, ha there are always the situations where someone is being sort of a bad actor about it, like they're intentionally being mean to other people so they you don't take their kingdom away or whatever but most people are really well intentioned and so what i would say is if you if there is like a big long like um the fish hatchery as an example booth society we had a garden party that for a long time it was a sit down meal for a long time it was a like i don't know it's a 50 dollar uh, plate thing which only allowed a certain group of people in town to attend. And then you had kind of the same crowd every year. Now, don't get me wrong. Those people were incredibly generous and amazing uh, supporters of the hatchery. But at the same time, we wanted to invite other kinds of people to to the table so we tried to make small changes to it and change the format a little bit and all kinds of things i mean in the end we decided to not pursue that format i think i haven't been on the board for a few years so i'm not sure what they're doing now but just to the point of how can we just change things slightly to try to to bring in more supporters to welcome a different group of people because that's really what a lot often happens is you have the same people on the board for a really long time that means that you have the same their friends their network that's coming and how do you make that more dynamic and, and change that up a little bit and so that's but it's very threatening in a lot of ways and so one of the ways we did it on the booth societies we have a term limit that we actually enforce so if you've been we have a three-year Three year terms, I think, and then um, that you get elected to the board, and then after three elections, nine years, which is a really long time, then you're expected to graciously go away. And if you don't, then you will be asked to go away. So, and that actually keeps that, oh, yeah, right, there you go. It actually keeps the board with a lot of good historic knowledge, but also an opportunity to change and be dynamic. So, there's a couple ways you can solve these problems once you sort of get to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the really the number one probably challenge, there's a lot of things that drive us all crazy. The number one challenge probably for boards are unspoken conversations left unspoken mm -hmm. because no one's really the boss and no one, it's not a business and no one has to call anybody else on their eye rolling or, you know, naysaying or secret second meetings. So um, I guess it, that is that's a part of it that's a part of dealing with it and knowing you know being 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 ready to be strong enough to be the person who says hey listen judy you you know you don't sound happy about that let's talk about it even if you feel like well it's not my place i'm just new somebody has to do it um well you don't have to do it it is insane if you don't though so yeah. so if you want to operate on a good board and you want to actually achieve some things then I think that's great advice where you have to be ready and for order tolerant types, that's not going to be super easy for you. But one secret I learned from an introvert friend of mine a long time ago is if you speak out early in the meeting, just a tiny thing, like ask a quick question, say hello to somebody or whatever, then you're more likely to speak up later. Whereas if you go to a meeting and you don't speak the whole time, then at minute 50 of an hour meeting, you're not gonna probably speak up. So if you are seen and you feel like your comments are welcome or you're comfortable speaking up in a general situation, then you're more likely to ask a question or, or mm, not challenge, but ask, a, ask or try to bring out some, some of these sort of ideas that Meg is saying. So definitely um, culture types will help you navigate that a lot, I think. All right. Well, we're going to jump off here in a second, but I did want to welcome you to put your comments and thoughts about your boards, or I would love to hear board nightmare stories because that'd be super funny. Because <laughs> this is what we live for. This is what we live for. Border crises. That's right. That's right. Sorry. So I just want to mention that. Did you have any no, thoughts or anything? No, I, I don't have any. I am super impressed that you are this put together. Your eyes are a little glassy. 
I, well, so I told I Quillen see. I had to dress all up and even put makeup on because I knew that really I, for as shitty as I feel, and I know my eyes will tell on me that I better look hot. Well, and it does get, <laughs> clothes can give you the armor, right, to feel better or yes. at least feel capable. Yes. Even if you don't right? feel good. I, I will not cough on anyone while Thank I am you. out in public. I'm going to be like washing the hell out of my hands. You I'm definitely should. You should here. probably spray some Lysol in your mouth. Good. On my face. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on what we have as a snowy day, but hopefully it's beautiful where you are. All right. Lead powerfully. Change the world. Bye, everybody.